church family, I want to invite you to take your copy of God's Word, turn to the book of Hebrews. We are going to be in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Go ahead and find your way there. And when you have found your way there, I want to also ask you to come with me and draw attention to our worship folder that you received on your way in. First things first, I would ask for everybody to pull out the Connect card. If you're a guest of ours, we would love to get acquainted. We'd ask for you to consider putting your contact information on the card so we can get to know you a little bit. Uh, On the back of the card, we would ask for everybody to let us know how we could be praying this week for you and your family. So go ahead and fill out a prayer need. And uh, when we are dismissed, you can leave this in your seat or you could put it in offering baskets in our foyer on the way out. I also want to ask you to kind of hold this close uh, for the end of the sermon, kind of keep this Connect card close by. Let me also ask you just to look with me at a few of these announcements in our bulletin. Uh, I want to remind you for our church members that today uh, is our annual business meeting at 4 o'clock in the worship center right in here. Uh, And you can read the information about uh, some of what we will be accomplishing tonight, Lord willing. So if you're a member of our church, we invite you, we would ask for you to come back in here at 4 o'clock. I know that it is just December, but I do want to highlight one thing coming up in January because uh, you may need to be aware of this ministry or you may know someone, family or friend, who would need to be aware of this. Our divorce care ministry will start a New Year session uh, beginning January 7th. And so I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to help spread the word. If you need this ministry, or if you know someone who does, would you please share this information about our divorce care ministry and let the Lord do his work in their life. Uh, College and young adults, just a reminder, you have your ugly sweater Christmas party on December 16th. It's Saturday, so be aware of that. And then also want to highlight that we have our group going to the Operation Christmas Child Processing Center tomorrow. Just want to make sure you're aware. If you're interested, there are six spots available. And so you can talk to Nikki Handlin about that, read the information about the details of that trip. Uh, let me also just highlight one more date. Uh, next Sunday, December 17th, our Christmas night of worship, right in here, 6 p.m. Our music ministry will lead us in worship, so we want you to come. And hey, invite family members, invite friends, invite neighbors, uh, and let's gather together and worship tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow night, uh, next Sunday night, the 17th. With that being said, I want to read our text. It is one verse. Our focal passage is one verse, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Let's pray. So God, we have heard your word read multiple times, and I praise you. I thank you for that. And we have prayed to you. We have sung to you. We have given in worship. And we have your word open now before us to do what is your idea, to preach your word, to hear your word preached. And Lord, since it's your idea, we ask that you would do what you want, what you intend to accomplish through the preaching of your word. I ask that spiritual eyes and ears will be opened. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to look in chapter 1, verse 6. I want to raise a conundrum. Chapter 1, verse 6 says this. And again, when he, that's God the Father, when he brings the firstborn, that's God the Son, Jesus, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Okay, so that's, That's Christmas in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. The firstborn is brought into the world. And God the Father says, 
let all God's angels worship him. We actually see that come to fruition in passages like Luke 2, where while shepherds are out tending their sheep, angels appear and herald the coming of the firstborn son. Okay, I want to now draw a conundrum between that verse and chapter 2, verse 9, the first part of the verse. So go to chapter 2, verse 9. The first part of the verse says this, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. So here's the question I want to ask between these two verses. How do we get from being worshipped by the angels to being lower than the angels? And if we think about it, it's a simultaneous thing. God the Father called for the angels to worship him when he brings him into the world, which is the moment when he is made lower than the angels. He is identifying with mankind. If you look up in chapter 2, verse 6, it has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. And now the writer of Hebrews is showing us that when Jesus came into the world, he is fulfilling that text. So here the question again, and I'm going to ask another one. How do we get from Jesus being worshipped by the angels in chapter 1 to him also being lower than the angels in chapter 2? Now let me add a question to kind of make another layer for our conundrum. Furthermore, how is it, and I'm keying in back in chapter 2 verse 9, how is it that the Son of God, if you kind of follow along the rest of the verse, how was he crowned with glory and honor because he experienced the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. That's what chapter 2, verse 9 says as we read the rest of it. I'm asking, how is this? How is it that the Son of God was crowned with glory and honor? If I stopped there, that would make a lot of sense. If I said the Son of God is crowned with glory and honor... Most of us would not balk at that. It just makes sense that God the Son would be given honor and glory. But I'm asking, how is it that he was crowned with glory and honor because he experienced the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone? So I ask these questions. Because I believe that Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, our sermon text addresses these questions. Let me read the verse again. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. I believe Hebrews 2.14 answers our questions. Let me give you the sermon outline in two very simple obvious portions. Number one, the son was born. Number two, the son was killed. How easy is that for sermon outlines? The son was born, the son was killed. That's the way to outline verse 14. Let's first look at how the son was born in the first two parts of the verse. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. The son was born. Jesus Christ fellowshiped with flesh. We are told that the children shared in flesh and blood. Let's be crystal clear. Who is he talking about? Who are the children? Well, in verse 9, they are referred to as everyone. The end of verse 9, for by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In verse 10, they are referred to as sons, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. In verse 12, they are referred to as brothers. I will tell of your name to my brothers. 
in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And in verse 13, they are referred finally as children. I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. And then we read into our verse, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood. And now this word shared, I want to highlight it for just a moment. It is the Greek word, I'm going to say it because many of you are familiar with it, koinonia, a Sunday school class named after that word. I won't pop quiz all the members of that class to see if they would know what it means, but it means fellowship. That's why I say Jesus Christ fellowshiped with flesh. Well, the first part of that fact is the children, the people being referred to, have been fellowshipping, sharing in flesh and blood. That's what it means, that they, they have this fellowship. They have something in common. We have something in common. We are flesh and blood. The children share in that. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, since the children share in flesh and blood, therefore... Christ did something. That's the logic of the verse. Now, verse 14 starts with the phrase, since therefore. I just want to simply take the logic of the verse. I want you to hear. Let me read it this way. The children share in flesh and blood. Therefore, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That's the logic of it. It's the inference. Because because the brothers, because the congregation, because these sons, because everyone shared in flesh and blood, therefore Christ partook of flesh and blood. I want to highlight that word for a moment, partook. It's a similar concept, but it's distinct. It's different than fellowship. He partook of flesh and blood. The idea is that someone reaches out, takes something that's not naturally already a part of their nature or identity, they take it. That's what Jesus did. This word is used for meals, for food and drink. We partake of dinner. You take something that is not in your body and you partake of it. You enjoy it. You you put it in your body. I want us to realize the significance, the connotation of this word and try to realize that's what Jesus is doing. This may not be a perfect analogy, but I think it's helpful. So yesterday, we went to the new meat market in town. You could imagine that that would have my attention. Went in there for the first time, liked what I saw. I mean, if you're going to go into a meat market for the first time, you should get a combo, a, you know, like a sample platter. Just kind of grab multiple items and put it all together for dinner. So we got pork tenderloin, and uh, we got a bacon-wrapped filet, and we got a porterhouse for the head of the household. <laughs> and we also saw alligator sausage. And we got some alligator sausage. We said, why not? When in Rome, let's do this. And so last night, I threw pork tenderloin and bacon-wrapped filet and porterhouse and alligator sausage on the grill, looking forward to it, but yet not partaking of it. I didn't partake of it until I put it in my mouth and swallowed it. And I must say, alligator sausage is not bad. Spicier than I expected, which I felt dumb because it says it's Cajun. That should have just been obvious to me. We agreed that's probably the best way to eat alligator meat. But I partook of alligator meat for the first time in my life yesterday. I took something that was not already a part of my identity, but as much as I could, I consumed it. I, I put it within me. Now let that idea kind of get us going in the trajectory of what it means when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, partook of the same things, namely the flesh and blood of humanity, he said that, I'm going to take that on as part of my identity. So John tells us in chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the doctrine of the incarnation of the Son of God. The Son of God, 
who is also the son of man. He is God and man. Now, as I told you last week, I consult several commentaries most weeks as I study. Uh, Last week, I had my favorite scholar who was uh, one of our devotional writers. This week, my favorite scholar is Allie McCarthy, one of our 10th graders at the church. She wrote the journal and the devotional entry for this passage. I hope that you read it. Let me say, if, if you grabbed a devotional over the last couple of weeks, I hope you're using it. I want to encourage you to this Advent season. If you didn't, if you've not grabbed one, there are some more available out in the foyer. I want you to grab one. I want you to use them. It's very brief. You could easily catch up. And Allie gave us such good material. Listen to what she says. She says, Christ, who is fully God and fully man, Okay, that's good theology, y'all. That's gospel theology. He is fully God and fully man. He can identify with us in all our humanity. He felt hunger, disappointment, anger, tiredness, fear, loss, loneliness. But unlike us, he experienced all of these weaknesses without choosing to sin, end quote. Jesus can identify with us in all those ways and many more. And I want to ask a basic question. Why would he do that? I want to ask, why? Okay, I know it explains, well, because the children share in flesh and blood. But I want to ask one more layer. But why would he partake of the same things? And the answer is, Jesus Christ did all of this to die. That's why he did it. You may want to go to Luke chapter 2 with me. I'm going to be there for just a moment. I want to show you kind of sort of the less famous part of Luke chapter 2. Luke 2, we will, we will savor it again as we have every Christmas Eve together where the birth of Jesus Christ is narrated. I want to go to, to a part of the back half of the chapter, not quite as famous, but I want to show you where there is an, there's a hint There's a hint that Jesus, this baby who was born, was born to die. So in Luke chapter 2, verse 22, just kind of follow along. It says, when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him, that means Mary and Joseph, brought baby Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Remember how Hebrews 1, 6 says he was the firstborn. So we see that playing out here. And offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And before I keep reading, I kind of want to marvel at how you can tie that verse into the idea of what we're reading in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. He would not die until the baby would be born, who was born to die. Just I love the irony, just the beautiful irony that God has in his word. It says he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said... Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, and here's where we hear the hint that this baby was born to die. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Can you imagine hearing that during a baby dedication? Mom, there's gonna be a sword to pierce your soul because this kid will be opposed. But that's why Jesus did all this. He came to die. So remember, we we break the sermon into two main points. The son was born. The son was killed. And 
In my notes, I have a little parenthesis phrase. Really, the son was born to be killed. So I want to go back to Hebrews 2.14, and I want us to focus for a moment on the last part of it. We read the verse again. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. And then we get the purpose statement that, that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So Jesus Christ fellowshiped with the flesh, he was born, and Jesus Christ defeated the devil and death through death, he was killed. Jesus Christ fellowshiped with flesh, he was born. Jesus Christ defeated the devil and death through death, he was killed. We are given a very similar statement where John the Apostle writes in 1 John chapter 3, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now we're told in Hebrews 2, the devil has the power of death. He's the one having the power of death. It's, it's kind of in his hands and I, I certainly want to say that that is, that is most definitely true. I would never argue with scripture. But we also know that there's this implied sort of he has the power of death, sort of. God is the one who, who holds the reins. We see that in the book of Job. Satan had to do exactly what God said he could do. He, God drew parameters. And so the one who has all the ultimate power and authority is God. And yet Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the, the, the enemy, the accuser, the Satan, he is the one who has the power of death. And Jesus' death has defeated the devil. His death defeated the devil. Now, I want to ask another very basic foundational question. How? Let's ask that question. How did Jesus' death defeat the devil? It would be easy and not wrong, but easy to say, well, because he came back to life. We just sang about the resurrection. All right, we, we celebrate the resurrection. We know you do not have Christmas without the fact that Jesus would grow up, go to the cross, be buried, and rise from the grave. You've got to have the resurrection. But this text does not address the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says through death he would destroy the one having the power of death. And I want to ask how did Jesus' death destroy or defeat the devil? I think we find an answer in verse 17. If you just go down to verse 17 with me, let's spend a moment in this verse. You're going to see a word that Matt used just a few moments ago. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. And that's what Allie's devotional entry celebrates. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. How did Jesus' death destroy the devil? The answer is given to us in verse 17. Because through his death, he was able to be both the priest and the propitiation. He was able to be both the offerer and the offering. Priests were given a role to bring together a holy God and sinful humans so that humans could worship God, be reconciled in relationship to God in spite of their sinfulness. And one of the things the book of Hebrews celebrates is that Jesus, as we saw last week, is our great high priest. But the priest is also the propitiation his death accomplishes. So you ask, well, what does that mean? What that means is when Jesus died, imagine a priest putting an offering on the altar before the Lord or burning an offering before the Lord. That's so what's happening when Jesus dies. What happens there is that the death of Jesus, because he never sinned, satisfies God's wrath and it enables God's love. That's what propitiation is. There is a demand that must be met 
by a righteous, holy God, and we cannot pay that. It had to be paid for us. Jesus was our propitiation. He fully satisfied, appeased. He paid in full the debt that our sin created before a holy, righteous, wrathful God who loves us so much he sent his son. He gave his son so that we could be reconciled with him. That is how Jesus' death defeated the devil. So I want to ask you a question that Allie asks us in her devotional. She asks this question. I want you to ask yourself this. How does Jesus, being fully man, comfort you and encourage you? And I'm going to tell you it should. It sure can. How does Jesus, being fully man, comfort you and encourage you? Or, to put it another way, how does the fact of the incarnation of the Son of God give you comfort, give you encouragement, give you hope? Well, let me suggest some things, a couple of which we've already noticed. Number one, I want you to hear this, he can identify with us. He can identify with you. You are not alone. Listen to this list that Allie gave us. He felt hunger. He felt disappointment. He felt anger. He was tired. He felt fear. He felt loss. He felt loneliness. Any of those emotions represented in this room this morning, I'm going to imagine yes. And know this, you have a heavenly father who loves you so much that he gave his son who would be able to identify fully with you in those emotions. So that's one way the incarnation can encourage you. Second, the truth we just explored in verse 17. The fact that Jesus fellowshiped with flesh and then gave his flesh and blood for us on the cross is what enables us to have our sins atoned. Let the incarnation comfort and encourage you because it is what made atonement possible. You and I can be forgiven of our sins. We can have our sinfulness covered. That's what atonement means, to cover something. But I also want to show us one more thing. I want us to see how verse 14 finishes. It's just a sentence that flows into the next verse. You kind of can't have verse 14 without verse 15. Let's begin reading at the the very beginning of verse 14 again and just kind of follow it all the way through the end of the sentence. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death We're subject to lifelong slavery, end of sentence. That's how that thought finishes. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. We can be encouraged by the incarnation because Jesus Christ has defeated the devil and delivered us. Jesus Christ has destroyed the one who has the power of death, and Jesus Christ has delivered the ones who have a fear of death. I want this to kind of infiltrate souls right now. Because Jesus willingly took on flesh and blood and then sacrificed himself for us, You and I no longer have to live in fear. I mean, how encouraging is that? We do not have to live in the fear of death, which it says in this verse is lifelong. Deliver all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. If you have not been forgiven of your sins, if you have not given your life over to Jesus Christ and received the redemption that he has provided, you are still shackled in your sinfulness, living in lifelong fear of death. How ironic is that? Painfully ironic. 
spend one's life in fear of death. And that is a reality. Just kind of watch the world and you'll see that over and over again. People living their lives in constant fear of death. But be encouraged. Jesus took on flesh. He wants to take away your fear. Listen again to one more statement that Allie has given us in her devotional. She says this. When he followed God's rescue plan to the cross and experienced a death that we deserved, he destroyed the power of death forever and made it possible for us to experience eternal life and fellowship with the holy God. I mean, that's answering my question. How does Jesus being fully man comfort you and encourage you? Well, the most ultimate reason is because he destroyed the power of death forever and made it possible for us to experience eternal life and fellowship with a holy God. And so I finished by asking you a very simple question. I probably ask this question every year come Christmas time. Are you celebrating Christmas? Because, I mean, it, things have ramped up, right? Christmas parties have happened or are on the books the next week or so. I mean, hot chocolate being served and Christmas lights have popped up all over the neighborhoods and, and the carols and all that. And everybody's decorated. I mean, this is happening, right? That train, it's in full motion now. We're celebrating Christmas. No, I'm asking you, are you really celebrating Christmas? You can only do so if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, who took on flesh and blood and became the propitiation for your sins. Are you celebrating Christmas? Now, at the beginning, I asked you to keep close by this card. I just, as I do from time to time, want to point out that on the back of this card, right here towards the top, there's a box. It says, my next step today is, you have the option, give my life to Christ. If you in this moment realize, man, I am not able to celebrate Christmas like you're talking about. But you feel this, this, this desire for that. I want you to check that box. Make sure you put your information on the front of the card so we can contact you. We want to have a conversation with you about Christmas. We want you to be able to celebrate Christmas for the first time. I want to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes with me. So God, I ask that we are able to celebrate Christmas this morning and all through the rest of the month. I'm asking that in the fullest sense, Lord, not just, not just the, the details of how we celebrate Christmas, but know why and the reason, the very foundation of Christmas, the fact that you sent your son, your firstborn, for the sake of his brothers and sisters, for the sake of us. And you sent him to die so that through his death he would destroy the one who has the power of death. God, that is why we can celebrate. I pray for those of us who are in here gathered, I pray for our church family as a whole that you will be celebrated this Christmas season. We thank you for doing what you have done. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Church, would you stand as we respond to the word, a singing of the mightiness of our God. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His
His craft and power are great And armed with cruel hate On earth is not His equal Did we in our own strength confide Our striving would be losing were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is He. Lord Sabaoth, His name. From age to age the same And he must win the battle And though this world with devils filled Should threaten to undo us We will not fear For God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Amen. I want to invite you to take a seat for just a moment before our benediction. We are going to have a benediction reading, uh, but I don't want to do this one alone. I don't want to stand up here by myself this morning. I'm going to ask, and they do not know I'm about to do this, but I'm going to ask Philip and Nancy Vaughn, would you please come up here and join me uh, for our benediction moment? And uh, as many of you already know, uh, Philip announced Wednesday at our Christmas salt luncheon that uh, the Lord has shown him that it is time for him to retire from vocational ministry uh, at the end of this month, and I just want them to come up here, come up close. I, I, I won't bite, and I did bathe this what? morning. <laughs> I want us to celebrate Philip and Nancy. Church family, first off, can you please show your appreciation to this wonderful couple? <clears throat> Absolutely. All right. Nancy, Nancy looked at me with a look that says, please have them sit back down. <laughs> this couple has served this church family for 20 years. And we told you on Wednesday, we love you. We thank God for you. And again, I just want to say to Philip directly, as a pastor, I have admired you so much. And you have run such a good race. We thank you for that. We have a couple of tokens for you. Let me grab these. Nancy wants to give you these. Just a small token of just the beauty that God has given this church and you. And then this also is a gift from the church family to you. We're going to let Nancy be responsible for this to make sure that it gets home for you guys to open and, and all that. So let her be responsible for that. And I want to say to the church family, we've provided an opportunity for you also. And there are certainly many ways you can do this. But to show your appreciation, we have cards available in the lobby. 
uh, and we pass these out for those who are at SALT as well. But we just wanted to make cards ready on hand. I would encourage you to take a card, uh, write a note to Philip and Nancy. There's a basket out there. You can put it in. Feel free to take the card home and take your time with it and write what you feel the Lord would have you to thank them for what they have done. You can either mail it to them. You can bring it back to the office. You can bring it back next Sunday. We're just going to try to help collect these cards of encouragement as something that they can take and just read a portion of what they have meant uh, to our church family. So again, Philip and Nancy, we love you. We thank God for you. Let me read our benediction. And I love how this verse ends, knowing the way that you guys have worked so faithfully for the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58. I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And y'all tell me if this verse does not summarize the ministry that Philip and Nancy have given this church. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, to which we all say, amen.